Hey there, Josh Ellis here, the editor-in-chief of Success Magazine, and today I have the pleasure of sitting on the front porch of none other than Chip Gaines. Chip, of course, you know, he and his wife host the hit HGTV show Fixer Upper. They've got the best-selling book, The Magnolia Story. Their hit magazine is The Magnolia Journal, and Chip's new book is Capital Gains, The Smart Things I've Learned by Doing Stupid Stuff. <laughs> Chip and his wife, Joe, grace the cover of Success this month, but we have the pleasure now of a one-on-one, -on -one, me and Chip, right here. Chip, it's a pleasure. Uh, vice versa. Thanks for having me, man. Glad to be here. So, our cover story gives a great in-depth of, of your ex, your experience uh, sure. as an entrepreneur. Um, a lot of people know you just from the show, um, but the background story is not something that, that everyone is familiar with. So sure. tell us where you were when you and Joanna met and how you got to become the, the fixer-upper couple. <laughs> well, first of all, the way you said the uh, uh, smart things I learned doing stupid stuff, it sounded hurtful like the way you said it. When we thought it <laughs> out loud, we thought that's witty, that's funny, but I mean, I hope it's, uh, hope it comes off endearing, you know, as opposed to uh, what an idiot, you know, am I gonna be able to learn anything from this guy? Uh, I'm only, only joking, but, uh, but yeah, Joe and I met, you know, we're honestly, I think part of the appeal from, from our perspective is that we're sort of like the couple next door, you know, I mean, uh, in the 90s, there was a popular book going around call, called The Millionaire Next Door, and it was just saying the average millionaire is just a, a person like you and I, you might be a mechanic or a car salesman or a, a, a Firestone uh, operator to some extent, and Joe and I are, I think we kind of fit that, that bill a little bit. So we're just normal couple. Uh, I grew up in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. She was from just outside of Austin originally. Um, her parents moved to Waco, Texas uh, about 10 years years prior to she and I meeting, and they had this uh, Firestone dealership. So basically, she was in the office managing this tire shop, and I would go into the tire store, and there was this beautiful picture, if you've ever been into these small businesses, to where it's like the husband and the wife, and then in their case, they had these three beautiful daughters. And I'd look as I was cashing out, I'd get my brakes done, get an oil change, I'd be cashing out. But the whole time the guy's making contact, was just, yeah, whatever, put it on the card, looking up at these three gorgeous daughters. And I just thought if any three of these daughters would ever just wa accidentally walk out through these swinging doors, I would be in hog heaven. So I consistently came in to get my brakes done, consistently came in for oil changes. I mean, I would come in for an oil change like on a Friday and then like on a Tuesday of the following week, I'd come back, hey, oil, oil change, give me one oil change. And so somehow through that, me being in that Firestone shop incessantly, she finally walked through the doors and the fact that it was her instead of her beautiful older sister or beautiful younger sister was just sort of destined to happen. So once we met, we started dating and uh, about a year after that we were, we were married and then sort of obviously the rest is history, but we just started like everybody else. I mean, normal people, our parents were uh, fairly middle-class folks and uh, one thing led to, led to the next. One of the real assets that you and Joe both possess, I think anyone would say, is likability. Mm. And I've got to think that for anyone in entrepreneurship, that goes a long way. Sure. What do you think? I think you're likable. Okay, because somebody said once that the more you get to know me, the less likable <laughs> I am. Are you, are you Was it Joe? That? Joe is actually uh, guilty of that, for sure. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I'm, you know, likability, authenticity, passion, you know, those are kind of catchphrases for some people, but for Joe and I, it's really how we live our life. You know, I mean, this is our farm. Uh, this is our front porch. This, you know, I mean, even the idea, I don't want to overstate this part of the equation, but, you know, when you come onto a construction site, it, you know, in my universe, you know, people in your industry refer to it as a set. And that sort of drives me nuts. You know, that kind of gives me glitches because for me, it's a construction site. And I think something about that translates to the, to the viewer. I think they, they believe us when we say we're doing the work that we're doing. I think they believe that we've got the relationship that it appears that we've got on television. I think uh, it appears that we're good parents. And I think that they believe that that's accurate. You know, I mean, you can go talk to a couple of the kids and I'm sure that they can tell you the uh, behind the scenes reality of that. But um, for us, you know, I mean, I just think passion and hard work and, and the idea of never quit, you know, I mean, those are things that have so certainly fueled us over a, a hard, complicated, but amazing 15 year, 16 year career. What sort of role does 
vulnerability and openness too. I mean, you, you, you guys are an open book in a sure. lot of ways. And so you talk about that, I know, in, in capital gains. What, sure. what sort of role does that have in, in, you know, being able to convince people of things? It, you, you talked about selling earlier. Sure. You're, you're in a way still selling things. That's a fact. Yeah. And I think that, uh, for us, I think when we reached a certain point in our career to where we kind of felt like we could take a breath for the first time. I mean, there were, there was a good 10 year run to where Joe and I literally were consistently worried about things that most people take for granted, paying your mortgage payment on time, uh, uh, having enough money in the bank to feed your family, having enough money in the bank to try to save just, just peanuts at the time for maybe a college, uh, uh, potential future college tuition for your kids. And I mean, I think that pressure over 10 year period has now that we're sort of on the other side of that realizing, you know, A, we can breathe a little bit. We've got some resources to pay the mortgage and to take care of the kids, things that pressure has been relieved a bit. Um, it has made us almost like switch our thought process to now it's like, how can we uh, encourage the people that are behind us to some extent to keep going, to stick to it. And I think that vulnerability and that and that transparency, if you will, is important to us now at this point in our career because we want people to know it wasn't easy. I mean, this was not, you know, I mean, there was there was some being in the right place at the right time moments, and I think anybody could argue that it's like the old football adage that the 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 more fundamental you are, the more the the more the lucky breaks bounce in your favor, you know. And certainly, Joe and I have been the recipients of some of those, you know, good breaks. Uh, but at the same token, we have had our fair share of really tight calls, really tough moments and moments to where we were literally on our knees in prayer saying we can't quit. We cannot give up. You know, there's too many people that depend on us in that particular season. There were fewer employees, but we're still talking about roughly a dozen household incomes that were personally dependent on Joe and I. And that was very important to us. But then it even got into the bankers and the local relationships that we had established. We just didn't want to let these people down. And so every morning we'd wake up and we'd get after it. And the idea that, you know, one step in front of the other finally resulted in us basically breaking through. Um, I hope that's an encouragement to folks that are going through that same kind of experience. We talk a lot in the magazine about passion and purpose. And I'm curious about what the purpose behind your passion is. Your passion is about fixing up houses. And sure. so uh, what, do you, what do you hope that people get across? What are, what are the, some of the, um, the big picture uh, ideas that, that you're trying to share? Sure. For us, it's uh, it's people. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, we've got lots of employees. We used to have few employees. At the end of the day, it, it, that's just a number. The reality is there's people that help us uh, facilitate what we do for a living. Um, in the real estate side of the business, it's even more tangible from my perspective. And again, everybody can argue this because if I was a car salesman, I'd be passionate about the people in that business. Well, for me, it's the home business. And for us, good things happen at home. You know, it's where, where life happens. It's where love happens. It's where the adventures, the ups and downs, um, almost all the experiences that Joe and I refer to in our childhoods happened in, at home. And so for Joe and I at an early age, when we started selling these houses to couples, we learned really quickly, there's an end user in, in mind here. There's an actual person that we would visualize. We would daydream about him. Joe and I would even kind of sometimes kind of playfully, maybe even sarcastically, but we would pretend like we were engaging with the couple that we were doing this renovation for, even though in, in those days they were flip property. So we would buy a house, renovate it, and then put it on the market. So of course we had no idea who the actual end user was going to be, but we would, we would pretend to know them. You know, we would daydream to know them. And for us, I mean, I think once you kind of get past the money and the variables and the ups and downs and you really put a face and a person with the end deal. I mean, when you think about it, a computer is operated by a person. Um, medicine is taken by a person, you know, and when you put that face to the to the end deal and, and stop worrying so much about the profits and losses for us, it, it drives us to that next place. There are some parallels that can be drawn between home renovation and a renovation of your life, reinventing mm -hmm. uh, for someone who has a job, works nine to five, sure. drives through traffic, hates it, uh, that wants to make that reinvention, that renovation, sure. jumping into entrepreneurship, starting something. What sort of advice? How do you, how do you make that mindset shift? 
Yeah. And I mean, when you tie it to the house analogy, we do that a lot internally. It's just like there's so many similarities. You know, you can't build a great house without a good foundation. Um, and for us, I mean, the foundation's uh, the most important element. I mean, it's just uh, hard work commitment, honesty, integrity. I mean, all the things that, again, sound like catchphrases. And in fairness, you know, even even does. I mean, they could be a catchphrase. You, you know, who knows if we're lying about all these things. But the reason we're positive this is going to prove uh, the proof will be in the pudding in 10, 15 years from now is because we're serious. We're, we're, we're not kidding when we talk about integrity. We want our word to mean something to the people that we uh, communicate those uh, promises to and even houses. You know, I mean, nobody's perfect. You build a house, you do the best you can and somebody's, you know, toilet breaks. So there's a water leak in the foundation. I mean, variables happen and it's how do you how do you deal with those uh uh, sort of negative ramifications while while being, you know, kind of a, a person of integrity through the process. And so with Joe and I, it's just we always kind of bring it back. We always loop it back to the people involved, the person at the end of this uh, uh, process. And I think that's what kind of keeps us going. How about the idea of, of a daily renovation of mood, attitude? Sometimes we wake up on the wrong side of the bed or we wake up and just don't feel like getting up and putting in the work that needs to be done sure. to get the most out of the day. How do you keep going? You know, and that, that's a great question in this season of life. Five or six years ago, before the fame element, I was driven. You know, I was driven for success. I was driven for money um, in the best sense of the word. You know, I wasn't ever money hungry per se, but I was wanting to support my family. I wanted to live, you know, the American dream. You know, I was driven for those kind of end goals. And it was just a God-given thing. I wish I could say that I trained for it. I was built for it to some extent. It was just something I woke up. I was always on the right side of the bed. I woke up, I was always glass half full. You know what I mean? Uh, now, you know, five years into this really grueling uh, reality, you know, there's a lot of irons in the fire. There are lots of balls in the air. My kids are getting older. You know, at the very beginning of this, Drakey was about seven or eight. Now he's 12. He's almost a teenager. And my little Emmy, who's our youngest to seven now, she was a baby. I mean, she was a literal toddler. And so when you fast forward all that, so you increase the pressure with the family, you increase the pressure from success and business and business growth and some of these things, you know, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, it, it in the, for the first time in my life, is a, is a real challenge. And what I say to folks who question that is, I'm a firm believer that the only thing I can control on a daily basis is my attitude. And if I can get that right, even if I'm faking, you're better off faking a good attitude than accepting a bad attitude and a negative attitude. And I'm you know, kind of a firm believer in that. And sadly, I mean, this is kind of the first time I've made this confession. I would like to confess this to the success uh, viewers that, you know, I mean, there's been seasons in this last five years that I've had to fake that good attitude for the first time in my life. Uh, but I want to encourage you that the fruit of that, you know, the, the, the doing good things just for the sake of it uh, turns things in your favor just by by sort of natural order. And I understand you can argue people doing good things forever and it always working out to their uh, disadvantage, but I'm just a firm believer that if you'll keep at it, you'll stay with it, it's always right around the corner. You know, just when you're positive, it's over and you're dead and you're screwed and life is over as you know it, you know, you turn the corner and something amazing is, is, is waiting for you on the other side. You mentioned the seasons in life. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you're aware of and just where you are now, where sure. you want to be in five years, 10 years? You, you mentioned that 10 to 15 year time frame. How about 30 years from now? I'm, I'm not asking every sure. goal, but are you just aware of those seasons and how do you kind of plan for that? Absolutely, man. And we're really... Uh, uh, painfully aware of it currently uh, and, and in a positive sense. It's like, you know, I'm 42 years old, Joe's uh, younger than I am, but I know myself well enough to know that had I, um, had I experienced this level of success maybe in my early to mid 20s, and I had some friends that, that had that kind of success. You know, it's like you're out of college, you're out to conquer the world. You know, I had a season after college of about 10 years of really hard work and not a whole lot of real obvious positive uh, uh, feedback, you know, where I had a couple of buddies who started climbing the corporate ladder and uh, driving the beautiful cars and moving into the gated communities. And you kind of stand back and go, oh my gosh, this guy's got it all. And I just wasn't ready for that. You know, had I had received 
or, or been um, uh, uh, privy to this kind of success earlier in my life, I honestly think it could have made me, you know, arrogant, uh, hard, hard person to be around, these kind of things. But the fact that I, you know, kind of got a little chubby, I don't know if you can tell by my shirt's pretty tight. I try to wear tighter stuff to nah. reveal, uh, conceal things. But, you know, I got a little chubbier. I got these four kids that keep me grounded. I've got this beautiful wife that reminds me, hey, you know, it's not all about you all the time. So I think for some reason for me, that 10 to 15 year run of just really hard work um, has really given us the ability to take this success with a bit of a grain of salt. You know, I mean, for us, we can kind of take it or leave it. We're thankful for the success. Uh, we wouldn't trade it for anything. But the way we try to turn that success is now the reality that, look, we're not looking to be the richest person in town. We're not looking to be a glutton uh, to some extent. And I'm not critiquing anybody who chooses that route. I mean, it's uh, we're not throwing rocks. We no judgmental. Uh, we no judgment zone. But at the end of the day, for us, we have now realized that when we take this success and we sort of turn it and spin it back, how can we, you know, a, a perfect example is a guy named Clint, who's a carpenter on our show. You know, we met him four or five years ago and we were in very similar stages in life. I think we were just a little further down the road than he and his wife were, but they basically woke up one day in the middle of Houston, Texas and said, I mean, they left a six figure job. He came to Waco, Texas, wanted to build furniture for a living. I mean, you talk about giving it all up to go try something essentially that was a passion of his and you know uh, for him to have been on the show and now be so successful and the great things that he and Kelly are doing they've actually got to show themselves on the DIY network and so all that to say the only reason I use him as an example is that you know we we were able to take some of the good fortune that we had had received and figure out how to spin it off to somebody else and I hope when this is all said and done that's just an easy one because everybody knows Clint if you know the show but I hope when it's all said and done and we're sitting here on on this porch and I'm 80, I hope there's a hundred people like that behind us. You know, I hope there's a thousand people like that. I hope some of the employees that, that we currently employ go off and start businesses of their own and we're a, you know, a launch pad for their career. You know, that's, that's our goal. That's our hope in this whole, this whole crazy process. There's an old Zig Ziglar quote okay. of, you can have everything you want in life by helping other people get what they want. Wow. That's powerful, man. You bet. I believe it. I believe uh, Zig Ziglar was onto something. That guy is, uh, is a legend for a reason. When you hear things like that, that's one thing that really encourages me. I certainly don't know every quote. I don't know every great leader. I don't know every dynamic CEO. But when you read about some of these guys, some of the greats, and Zig Ziglar is certainly a great example of that. I mean, a leader among leaders is the way I would sort of refer to a guy like him. And you hear a quote like that, we're accidentally living that out. And it certainly is no coincidence. Obviously, he figured that out through his unbelievable journey that was his experience. For us, I mean, you know, I've never heard that quote, but I can tell you that when you say it, it resonates with my heart. I mean, it might as well have been something that he, he told me personally as maybe a mentor of sorts. And I don't know where we got all this. It might be faith. It might be our relationship. It might be our family. You know, obviously lots of variables to consider. But for Joe and I, you know, if, uh, if we can end uh, saying that like uh, Zig Ziglar did, we would certainly be happy. Chip, it's been great. You're one of the nicest people I've ever interviewed, I think. We have just a few uh, fun questions at the end, a few sure. rapid fire, if you don't mind. All right, let's do it. We like to ask everyone this. <laughs> What's a book that changed your life or perspective and why? Wow. Yeah, that's great. 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, I was a, a, a young entrepreneur trying to figure my way in this crazy world. Lots of advice from mentors that had done it a certain way or the other. And I read a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. And uh, something about it, a lot like that quote you just mentioned from Zig Ziglar, as he spoke in his book, I literally resonated to it to such an extent. I thought he was literally speaking to me. You know, it's like, I want to do it exactly that way. It's even ironic. In the book, he talks about uh, which one would it be? So it would have been the poor dad, which was figurative. He was really the one that ends up rich, you know. But the poor dad had this squeaking screen door, and these engineers would be coming in and out of his house as he was developing these amazing communities in the Hawaii area, but obviously a startup guy. I mean, he didn't have any money, didn't live in a fancy house, didn't appear to be rich by any superficial measures. And as the uh, screen door would squeak in and out, and I had a house, and I swear to you, when you would leave that house, it would 
and I literally was like, I'm this guy. I'm the, I'm the poor dad in this analogy. And it turned out pretty good for him. And I was pretty sure it would for me too. What's the best piece of advice someone has ever given you? Never quit. Don't ever quit. No matter what, no matter what the circumstances are, obviously there's a, a few variations that you've got to consider. Sometimes you do have to change course, which would superficially appear like, like you were quitting on the surface. But I mean, it's not about course corrections. It's not about modifications. Everybody's got to do that constantly. But don't ever quit. No matter how uh, tough things look, you know, there's always, there's always a silver lining right around the corner. What's the secret to success when working every day with your spouse or, or a loved one? Hmm. You know, I think for Joe and I, it's just mutual respect. You know, bottom line, the foundation we were talking about with some of these houses earlier, it's just we love each other. We care about each other. Um, we're for each other. And for me, that's it. I mean, I would do anything in the world to make sure that she um, was happy, made it, and... Um, I, I'm not saying I want to go out like a, a hero, but, you know, I mean, I fantasize about heroic things like that. And at the end of the day, I think it's heroic to show up to a job that you hate because, you know, you've got a family to feed. I think it's heroic to to uh, wash the dishes at, at night for your wife after a hard day's work. You know, I mean, I think if we'll break it down to tangible things that we can each do daily, then the big heroic stuff will become, it'll be more natural when that opportunity presents itself. But for me and Joe, I we pull for each other in a real way. We fight just like anybody else. I mean, there's nothing, there's no secret ingredient. There's no magic pill. You know, we fight like anybody fights. We disagree like anybody might disagree. But at the end of it all, the basis of our relationship is I care about her. And I fundamentally know beyond a shadow of a doubt that she cares about me. Lastly, how do you define success? <sighs> Man, I don't want to plagiarize Zig Ziglar, you know, right here at the end here. But I mean, you kind of threw that one as a softball to me. So I may take you up on it. But big picture, I mean, we're successful if, if at the end of this deal, if Joe and I are married, when we're on, on the rocking chair at 80, you can you can count me successful. If my kids are now in their 40s, and they look at me and they respect me, they think that I've uh, uh, done what I could to, to be the best dad in the world for those four beautiful babies in there, uh, consider me successful. And then from a business standpoint, um, you know, if my employees say that we've been good to them, that we've given them opportunities to, uh, to um, kind of move up in their own career or even branch out away from our company and do things that they were passionate about themselves, then yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll consider that a success. Chip, it's an honor. Thanks for having us out to the farm. You bet. Thank you.